very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here to give this talk on what I do. I basically study animal communication, in particular acoustic communication. And today's focus is going to be on how these small insects actually, in spite of their small brains, manage to solve problems that are quite computationally demanding. And I'll also talk a little bit more about the actual behavior itself. So the system I study is crickets. And this is a question I get very, very often. Why on earth would one study crickets? I hope everyone knows what crickets are. They're these little uh, dark, cockroach-like ins jumping insects that you can hear all around you the moment the dust falls. So crickets are interesting to anyone who's interested in acoustics for many reasons. They're probably the first terrestrial animals on Earth to have evolved communication with sound. And uh, they continue to be a very, very important group. They've diversified extensively. You get a broad range of signals going from fairly low frequencies to high into the ultrasound. So to give you some feel for the animals themselves, uh, crickets typically produce sound by rubbing their four wings together, so the first pair of wings. And the picture here shows you a cricket who's singing, is actually rubbing these two four wings together. And the reason that this produces sound is because these wings are specialized. One of the veins of the wing is actually modified. If you look at the underside, you will see a row of pegs. You can see blown up in this standing electron microscope image here. It's a row of very, very regularly spaced pegs. And on the margin of the wing, there's a plectrum. And at least in these two crickets, they're symmetric. So typically, when the cricket rubs the two wings together, the plectrum of one side actually hits against the row of pegs on the file of the other wing. It's like a knife rubbing against a comb, and that's what produces the fundamental sound, which is actually a series of clicks. And this series of clicks is then converted, if you like, by this, these two structures here, largely the heart, which is a resonator. And so what emerges ultimately is the resonant frequency of the system, which is what you hear as the cricket chirp. Um, the ears of crickets, so if you're producing sounds, then it makes no sense unless you can hear them. Crickets have ears, and their ears are on their first pair of legs, just below the elbow. I don't know if you can see this small flat structure here. And their ears are actually quite similar to ours in many ways. They also have an eardrum that vibrates in response to sound, and have more to say about that later. And both males and females have ears and can hear sounds. What do crickets use sounds for? All the adult male crickets sing, and they sing to attract females of their species. And it's been known for a very long time, so this is a painting from the early 1700s, which shows a male cricket singing at the mouth of his burrow, and here is a female approaching. You can see she's a female because she has this structure called the ovipositor to lay eggs, which only females possess. One can test this empirically. You can make a sound recording of a cricket song and play it out in the field, and you can attract females of the same species. So these songs are sufficient of their own to attract females. Each species, and as a group, there are about thousands of species of crickets, and each species has its own unique song. So if you make a song recording and you look at uh, a time series and a syllogram, this is what typical chirping crickets look like. This is three different species. And I'll play them to you.
their brains that vibrate when sound impinges upon them. And what they perceive is the amplitude of the pressure wave that impinges on So what they get is an amplitude signal, and there's no inherent directional information in that. So the way in which we actually localize sounds is by using two ears. And the reason we can do this is because if the sound is up to your left, it will hit your left eardrum very slightly earlier than going around your head and hitting your right eardrum. It's a small uh, time difference, maybe it's something like 100 milliseconds or something at max. If it's right in front or behind, then it will hit both your eardrums at the same time. So if both of your ears are getting signal in the exact same time, then you know your source is exactly in front or behind. If it's if there's a time delay between the two, then you know that it's out to one side. And that goes from zero to whatever is your max as you come to the side. Yeah. Ma'am, so you tell that if it's ahead or behind, we like it's in the same line, right? If I close my eyes, I can still tell where it is. Yeah, because we do a lot more. Yeah. But it shouldn't be able to, right? We should be able to. We do because of our ear structures as well. Oh, okay. This External ear does a lot of processing, which also helps you. And part of what it does is allow you to tell from front back because it changes the spectrum of the sound. But the azimuthal location is basically if you could use time delay information, you could compute it. And we know from a large amount of uh, behavior and neurophysiology that I'm not going to go into in this now. It's an independent job that vertebrate brains compute these, yeah? all the way from reptiles, birds, all mammals, including us. That's how we look at sounds. We compute these tiny, tiny time differences, uh, which arise as a function of the location in Azimuth. There's also a difference in the intensity because the sound is slightly louder at the ear uh, on the direction side of the ear that you hear it from. It's slightly louder, the sound is on my left, it's slightly louder on my left than it is on my right. And again, that inherently different is max at 90 and becomes okay. So if you can compute that also, you get cues for localization. And we do both. And many mammals, birds, reptiles, all of us compute it. But to compute it, we need a lot of hardware and we use millions millions of neurons. There are large areas of your brain that are dedicated to processing sound localization information. So here's where it gets interesting. Think of the poor cricket. These animals are tiny. Their ears are out here on their forelegs. The distance between the two is typically about half a centimeter and <coughs> there's no head there so there's really nothing. Okay. So if you look at the kinds of wavelengths uh, that we are talking about, typically the frequencies are 4 to 5 kilohertz for a typical bean cricket. We're talking of wavelengths 7 to 8 centimeter. The animal is much smaller than that wavelength. If you measure what these interaural intensity differences <coughs> are like, they're less than a decibel. And if you look, if you can compute the time delays, then they're really tiny. They're like 20 microseconds or something like that. So they're more than an order of magnitude smaller than the max time delays that vertebrates can work with if the vertebrates are much okay. So they're really small. So the delays that if they had to compute them would be really tiny and they don't have the hardware because their brains have thousands of neurons, not billions like they do. But as you can see, the cricket look exact. They have no problem. They look them. So how is this working? Okay. So the trick really it's in the ear itself. So I told you the eardrum <coughs> is on the foreleg. And if you cut a cross section through the cricket, this is what you see. It's backed by a long air canal, and this is part of the respiratory system. So insects, if you're familiar with this, are full of air tubes because they're breathing in very different problems. They've got breathing inputs right along the body, and they have these air tubes going throughout the body. So it's not strange for them to have an ear and air tube. What's interesting is that, so this air tube goes right through the leg 
and is connected with one of the respiratory inputs, which is spherical, mm -hmm. called that segment. And what happens is that sound not only impinges from the outside, sound enters the body through these spiracles, moves through the inside, and hits the eardrum from the inside. So, how much it vibrates really depends on, upon the interference of these direct and indirect waves. And as it turns out, purely as a result of this geometry and of the physics of the system, you get a directional here, which is that if the sound is on this side, then the eardrum on this side vibrates much more than the eardrum on that side. So in some sense, it constructs that directionality uh, by evolving a, uh, a structure, a tiny structure that actually gives it that directionality. So it doesn't actually continue it. Okay? Um, and this is just to show you the directivity pattern. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this, basically, if you put a microphone in the middle and move a sound source around the animal, if you had an undirectional receiver, then it should be equally intense, so all points should lie in the circle, that you can see that as you move to one side, it becomes much less intense. So basically, we're looking at a directional here. So these are directivity patterns <laughs> of predicates. So they use sort of physics rather than computation, like they use geometry rather than computation to, to solve the directionality problem. But all of this we're talking about is common source. The problem is much worse, right? Because when you're out there in the field, what you have is a large number of singing animals. Some of them are your own species, some of them are your different species, and then you've got vegetation and you've got the ground, and that also makes a mess of signals. So you've got multiple signals, but degraded signals, and you now have to find one source among them. In other words, you're faced with a familiar problem, which is the cocktail party problem. And a cocktail party problem basically means if you're in a cocktail party and everybody's talking loudly and you want to listen to that one conversation at the other end of the room, we are able to actually filter out everything else and pay attention to that and listening for that conversation. But do animals who are put into such situations, how do they manage and how do they manage to do this? That they that they actually are able to deal with this problem can be inferred from an experiment like this, where you have a female cricket, she's being tethered, and if you blow air at her, she will begin to fly. She will fly, but she'll go nowhere, so she's in tethered flight. And then you can play sounds to her from the side. If you play a sound that she likes, to the male of the same species, then she will turn towards it, and you can measure that turning response, because she'll try to steer towards it. In this particular experiment, there were two songs, two different songs playing together, one of her own species, the other of a different species, but at the same pitch and the same intensity. So there are these two loud sounds being played to her from close by. And as you can imagine, they'd be all mixing in air. But these animals can tell them apart and she'll steer to the song of her own species. So they are able to solve a cocktail party problem as well. Okay? So that's what a behavior experiment tells us. What's the trick? How do they manage to do this? Okay, this is a somewhat busy slide. Let me tell you what this is about. So here is the female receiver. There are three males singing at different locations. And this gives you what she might be hearing of these three males. So the closest is likely the loudest. And then you've got the one further and the one furthest, which is why it's a lower in amplitude. And they'll be in different phases. If you took a microphone and looked at the resultant output close to the ear, this is what it will look like because all of them would have mixed up. But if you put an electrode into one of the neurons in the auditory processing pathway, so this has now come through the ear, you get something much cleaner. Okay? So let me explain this experiment to you. So here, uh, an electrode has been placed inside one of these neurons, and what we're looking at is the activity of these neurons. 
on the track. Here is the sound. It's a very, very rhythmic set of pulses, and you can see the neuron follows it perfectly. Okay, it represents it perfectly. Now, while this one is playing on the same side, you play next to it a second sound, much louder, a different pattern. Same neuron now changes the pattern that it represents to the number one. And it more or less filters out the other one, which it was so nicely represented before. So basically, we are, insects also are able to process within their nervous system to focus on certain songs when multiple songs are being presented to them. How that happens, I won't go into greater detail. So the details the two, sig yes. two signals you played, uh, they belong to different species again. That's right. But this would work even if there were two signals of the same species, the louder one gets represented. Oh, so it's not the species, but just the louder one. It's if it's the same pitch, uh, the frequency of the vibration. So even if you have two identical songs, whichever is loudest at the ear gets preferential representation in the neuron on that side. So remember, we have two pathways. So this is important to understand the rest, so we just spend half a minute on it, which is that um, there are two ears, and the ear on this side will represent the loudest signal on each side, and the ear on this side will represent the loudest signal on, it, on this side. There are two parallel pathways, and they get compared. And whichever is louder between the two, that's where she turns. So basically, they reduce the problem, this complicated problem of multiple noises, to just two clearly represented patterns and then they make them repeat. If they are meaningful, there's a pattern recognition algorithm that runs in that. <coughs> okay. So let me move on to our actual work. So much of this was sort of known when I came into the like 20 years ago. And our question really was what goes on in the field. Okay, this is all very well, but do we it's really experience these cocktail party like situations or not? It's not that easy to answer this question. You have to do a lot of things because you can't just go and ask an insect. Can you hear one or can you hear three? No. We want to infer it. So how do you infer it? So the way we go about inferring it is okay, what defines the acoustic environment of a cricket? It's defined by all the males singing around. So the first thing you have to do is go out into the field and map all the singing males. And what you see here, all these little points, is the location of one chorus of males in the field. So you go out, you listen in, you track each singing individual, you flag the position, and you look at the station map. You can observe these over time and see whether they move. I'm not going to show you the data but they don't move in the course of the night. They move across nights. So the choruses are static within the night. They can change configuration across nights, but within the night they're static. Then we know what the songs look like, but you need to know how loud they are. You need to know how loud they are because that gives you some feel of how far out you can broadcast. And that's what we do here. So we creep up on a singing cricket with a sound level meter close to the ground and very, very cautiously keep moving away and measure how the sound pressure level decays. So each of these lines is what is being done in the habitat for a singing cricket. You can see these profiles of cricket in the And this is sort of an exponential uh, decay. So this tells you the attenuation profile of the sound. And then you need a third piece of information, which is how sensitive the ears of the cricket. Not entirely, and this is a bit of a problem because the source is a dipole. Okay, but uh, what we've done here is to take it in a random direction for each of the animals. So if you did this for a single animal, then it wouldn't be exactly. But roughly, you'll get some. So what it will change is where the source, but not really the the, the nature of the tree. Um. So the third piece of information you need is how sensitive the ears are. And for this, we do a lab experiment, and we'll put it up over here, where you can bring a cricket into the lab, and you can play the song that remains to her, starting at very, very low intensities. And then you see at what intensity she begins to orient and approach. So that gives you a behavioral estimate of 
when she will hear and respond to the call. You can also do this physiologically. They're pretty close, usually. We chose to do it behaviorally because that was what we were interested in. So you can put those two pieces of information because we have these attenuation curves and ask, this is distance, on average, at what distance does it fall below the hearing threshold of the attendance? On average, that's about 1.3 meters, which is why we put it at this point meter. And this is just an idealized figure showing you if you draw a circle one meter from each of these males on average, that's the limit of his broadcast range. Okay. So female standing inside this circle, here's this male. If the circles overlap, it means they just came down from these areas when you have problems. But that's how we come up with these estimates. You can play with them to add variation uh, in individual intensity, the means of expanding compatibility. Roughly, that's the situation. And what we get out of that is about 60% of the time, yes, they are in complete body back situations. So perhaps, yes, there is a problem. So let me show you now. We then do field experiments. So this is this tiny spot here, the cricket is being released and being filmed with an infrared camera set up in the field. And we have two speakers here playing the song of her species. Uh, this is Six decibels lower than this one. And now we're playing both together and it's like Intensities and intensity to establish this. 
uh, and we also know the point at which this bridge down. And we have some feel for turning angles and walking mouth lengths, both from these experiments and from the studies done in the lab. So we know how they move. Can we put all of this together to ask, can we predict how crickets will orient if we recreate such scenarios uh, in, in, in virtual reality? So basically, we modeled the acoustic environment and we modeled the auditory physiology. Yes. Is there any information regarding the health for the same species? The what? Regarding health of the uh, from the sound. Ah, oh, you asked me something very different. Um, a lot of people think yes. That um, animals that are in better condition may be louder, sing faster. Yes. They could be. It's a complicated story though, it's not so simple. But on average, yes. We're not finding as tight for But there is no study now. Okay. Oh, there are hundreds. But the problem is that they're all done under lab conditions. And lab conditions are very different from what you see out in the field. So a relation that you might see in the lab simply do not hold at all. And we've been doing a lot of work in the field and they're not quite as common. That's, that's why I've given a little bit of a caveat. But yes. Um, so, so here's the results of our experiments, which I showed you, and if you run a sort of bottom-up simulation where you place virtual females and you build in the physiology as well as some stochasticity in movement, you can pretty much recreate these parts at a population level. What do I mean by that? If you if you ask me the probability distribution of how many will appear here, 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 then I can probably give that to you. But if you ask me what will X cricket do, I'll say, you can't tell what individuals do, but you can recreate a population of parts. And we've done that successfully now for a range of conditions. Sorry, this, uh, so this 23 females is this one, and uh, only five is, so the, they are all of the same, same, same year, same, same. So, what are the difference? Um, why, why these females didn't reach it? So why is the number so large for this one and small for the? Oh, that's because you have to think of the attenuation with distance. Yeah, that's further. It's just distance. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So at the position of the female, this is the largest. Even though at source, uh, they're all the same. So, so where you are in space, because the attenuation curves are very And of course, it's a closed loop. So the moment you move, things change and you get sort of pulled towards the source that you first approach. It gets louder. Right, so this is just to give you a glimpse of this. So we think we understand the basics of how uh, they orient in these environments. And not we, but other groups uh, in Edinburgh have in parallel been building robots based on some of these principles to do some based navigation. Some of these have been fairly successful, but again, very few have actually been done. Just to give you a feel for some of the applications that people are now using this kind of thing for an understanding of cricket hearing, it's been used to build directional, small directional sound sensors for microwave vehicles, and there's also in some kind of experimental phase at the moment. Not by us, it is allowed. There is an even smaller fly, there's a different story, but I just want you to be aware of it. There is an even smaller fly. There is a fly that parasitizes crickets. It's about the size of a house fly. And it uses the call of the cricket to locate it and lay its eggs. Okay. Those flies are even smaller. And they can also orient and locate sounds. And their ears are really tiny and actually coupled together. So it's as though you had both of your ears actually on your neck, but coupled together. And this tiny sensor is also directional. And there's been a lot of work on figuring out what creates directionality in the system. And indeed, it's being used to try and make directional hearings. So if there are people who are interested in why such stuff is at all useful, well, there are, there are interesting applications that come out of studying these small animals. Um, but this is just the edge. 
edge. It's really the tip of the iceberg. Everything I've been talking to you about is like one or two species of onions. But ears come in incredible variety of forms. Just the ears of cricket. And here's just some examples showing you the morphology. Some of them have these cup shaped structures, some have these really weird triangles with holes in them, some are open tympanum. And it's only now that we have the tools to look at what these things are doing to sound. And they're doing all kinds of interesting things to sounds. So we may be looking at, I don't know, thousands of tiny, tiny directional sound sensors that work on some of the principles. So there's a lot to be learned, I think, by studying these further. I'm going to change track a little bit. And move from this much yeah. question yeah. in that experiment of part. Yeah. Now, if in the lower intensity one, if you put a different cricket species, did it, I mean, the same, spe I mean, in the, all the louder ones, you put uh, different species from the female. And in the less loud one, you put the same species of the female. Will yeah. it go towards the same species? Yeah, that, that again depends. So now it's a mix of recognizing the pattern and which is the loudest. loudest. Yeah. So if, um, even if the songs of the other species are much louder, okay, it is very unlikely that it will influence because there's also a pattern recognition filter mm -hmm. in addition to directionality. And the pattern recognition filter filters the output of the directionality. So they, it's very unlikely that it will. But if that is the only source, that, the, right. that of the other species, and it is sufficiently similar in pattern to mm -hmm. their own species, sometimes they in a, in a choice experiment, almost never. Okay, so I'll move a little from directionality to talk about tuning. And now we'll talk a little bit about pitch and frequency tuning. And I'll take you to a very different place. This is Kudrebu National Park in the Western Ghats, where also we've been working for 20 years. And there we have a large project on community acoustic ecology, which is looking at entire acoustic community, which means looking at all the animals that signal acoustically, all the insects that signal acoustically in a passion forest, and ask how in this situation they're each managing to get the message across. So if you walk into a forest, It's actually a canopy species. It's 
a false leaf gated it, and you can see why it's called a false leaf, because it looks very much like a leaf. It lives high in the canopy of trees, and it has a very nice thorn.
comes with a problem, right? It's a hard filter. You can't tweak it into that, right? And that's not very desirable. So we were curious, and so we studied this particular group of crickets, the tree crickets, which are amazingly interesting for a number of different reasons. I'm sure you have them around you, yeah, they're everywhere. Okay. And these little crickets, if I play the sound, I'm sure you can hear them. What we inferred from this 
was that this is not what is going on, they've just sort of broadened their tube. Okay. That raises other questions, of course, it won't be as good as getting signal response ratios. But However, more recently, we've had a different twist to this tale, which is if you change the intensity of the sound, the SPL of the sound, and plot the same frequency response at very loud sounds, which is 40 millipascals, there's hardly any tuning. As you lower the intensity, the system tunes up. And then it's more or less just about hearing threshold tightly tuned okay, to the frequency of the song. So it's almost as though it's loud that the <coughs> frequency response is broad. And if it's really soft, then it's really tight. And it makes sense because that's when you need a really good signal to non -tration. And incredibly, I'm not showing you the data here, this big shifts the temperature. So it's almost as though they're using two different strategies. So at low intensities, which means animals are <coughs> further from source, they're tightly tuned and are in register with that change with temperature. At high intensities, it just drops out. Okay? Which is pretty amazing because this is the same ear of the same animal, which is changing its tuning. So the tuning <coughs> isn't as static as we thought. To change. Okay, I'm going to, in the last five minutes, give you some other kind of fun stuff we do with these animals, which has to do with female choice. Okay, so this is the male tree cricket, here is the female, and these males actually feed the females, so they have a gland on the back, and they produce something that is obviously very attractive and nutritious because the females, after mating, will spend a long time uh, feeding on this. Why am I telling you this? It's because, just ignore most of this graph, females actually mate longer with larger males. So here is the time that the female will mate with the large male, and here is the time she will mate with the small male, but from the fourth of the time. So they do prefer larger males. So larger males have an advantage. But can she sense who is a larger male from afar? So if you look at some index of male body size, which takes into account a number of structures, including single structures, as a function of frequency, you find, as you might expect, that smaller males actually uh, have higher pitch, have uh, higher frequencies, because their resonators are smaller. Uh, larger males sing with lower pitch at a given temperature. So there is information in the pitch about the size of the male. Females use it. Again, we can go back to doing similar kinds of prototypes experiment. Experiments where basically what we're doing here is presenting two songs to them together of different pitch and asking two different probabilities. To cut a really long story short, except at the extreme ends of the distributions, they actually don't prefer one or the other. So there is information that they're not using. Maybe they're not using it because it's unreliable information. It can change. But they don't seem to care. But at close range, they can tell big males from small even without sound. Females also prefer louder males. So if you do similar experiments to what we did with the field crickets with differences in SPL between two, they will go towards the louder. So they approach louder males. And it's good to be big, it's good to be loud. Okay? So, good to be louder than your name. And one way that these animals have achieved it is by building an amplifier. And how do they do that? They, they make a little hole, they actually niggle out a little hole, really, and they sing across it and use it as a pathway, and they arrange their, their sounds three, at least three times a lot. So now your neighbor is no punk. <laughs> All right. So we make amplifiers. And what we found is, of course, as you might imagine, bigger leaves give you more gain in SPL. So this is a small leaf, which gives you hardly 4 dB. A large leaf 
the sleeves of the species they like to call from the actor, can give you up to 10 decibels. That's huge. Right, huge. Yeah. If you give these animals a choice of different sizes of leaves, you give them small or medium sized or large, extra large or plants we grow in the nursery which grow really large, what you find is that the probability that they will actually build these amplifiers goes up. In other words, if it's a large leaf, most animals are likely to tackle with this lot of amplification. If a small leaf, they're not going to suffer. Okay? So they're really sensitive. They gauge these things. They gauge the leaf size. They can go through higher. If you give them a choice between a small and a large leaf, which is what we've done in this experiment, so this is small leaves, these are large leaves, and what you can see is that actually this is 19 projects tested. Here are the small leaves, here are the large leaves. Everybody went for the large leaves. Why go for a small leaf if you can make a battle of all the large leaves? So they're actually able, and they also make the whole of the exact size to fit them. You know, you could make a whole too large, right? And then you won't be built up or too small. But they make the holes, as you can see from this picture, they're very good at making the holes the right size. Okay. Again, we don't know how. And we've begun to sort of, we have a lot of questions about this, so I'm going to leave you with those questions. How do these three crickets measure nail size? Because they're not using salt. Okay. But they know bigger males from smaller males. They may be using chemicals. How do they measure leaf size? Okay. We have some ideas in that none of this so far worked out. Uh, but I'd be happy to hear from physicists how this uh, how do they optimize vessels, the position of the, they also optimize the position of the leaf, they use the best position. So how do they figure out where to make it and how much of it? Do they use acoustic feedback? Do they learn to do this? Do they improve with age? We're trying to find answers to several of these questions. We'll stop here because I'm running out of my time to, to acknowledge all the great people who have worked with me over the years. Natasha Marfrey, my first PhD student. Who did all of the work of the field projects that I spoke about, including the simulation of apps with uh, multiple speakers? Uh, my collaborators, Fernando Montalegre, Bonnie Robert, in Bristol, with whom I collaborated to do some of the biophysics, and Pritik Dev, who did a lot of the, and Monisha, who did a lot of the behavior with the free cricket. Kaveri, my postdoc, with Kaveri, who worked on the tuning of the KTM. And Swati, who actually discovered a lot of the species and cars that we were But can hear in Thank you. We have the same structures like in mammals, the hair bundles and in the structures. Yeah. The same in, the, in, the, in the actual sensory receptors. Yes. But at the cellular level, it's very true. Is there also vesicular fluid? Yes. But then what is the room? I mean, okay. There's no vesicular. There is a vesicular. Is the vocal cord located? Uh, there's no, it's, it's, it's the wings, right? Yeah. Oh, the wings, the wings. Yeah. How about the temperature in the room? So this also has to be the years also. Sorry? Can also affect the year. The temperature also can affect the Yes, it does affect the tuning of the ears. Yeah, it's separate. Yeah, and the sound work. How do you separate them? Which one? Like, the effects on the ear and the sound. They're separate. They're both separate effects. So you can, I mean, you can, you can look at what's happening to the mechanics of the wing vibration by changing the temperature and looking at how that changes. So you put singing crickets at different temperatures. And you measure while they are singing, you measure the vibration. <coughs> and you can track the resonance of those structures. Are you suggesting no, a feedback between what we. No, I'm asking about uh, like the experiment you were discussing. Yes. You are changing the temperature. And yes. So the similar effect would be here for the PSU. Yes. So then. I think probably understood. So what we've done is we've taken a female in the behavior experiment. We've taken a female and she's orienting towards each of these songs, and at each temperature, we play them at different frequencies. So, when you are manipulating the frequencies for that animal, the temperature remains the same. Then you do the same experiment at it. 
temperature. So you're not changing temperature here. You showed some uh, simulation results. Uh, so, while doing the simulation, what kind of uh, like what kind of equations do you uh, simulate, or uh, what kind of terms do you take in, into account? Uh, so, there must be some equation of motion that is included. Uh, no, I think the way we do this is we have a probability distribution, let's say, of Turing language, and we pick randomly. So we're not doing this analytically. That's what you're trying to ask. Okay. So let's say we have a probability distribution of angles through which crickets might turn at each time that they turn. We then, for any step, pick randomly for one of those steps. So we're not actually modeling them analytically. Okay. Uh, I mean, how much so does one know about the structure of this name with the uh, ear? I mean, like the uh, how it mechanically works. Very little actually. Very, very little. And almost nothing about the material properties. But it's not too small, right? I mean, the size is like millimeters. It's a millimeter or so, yeah. But the thickness is much smaller. But uh, one can't just look at it and then. It can actually. I mean, I'm sure material scientists can. It's just that, yeah, I have not collaborated for that. So that is the one which distinguishes the patterns, right? The different uh, nature of the eardrums distinguishes the patterns? Uh, the eardrums are useful for frequency filtering. Frequency filtering. Yeah. But the temporal pattern recognition is a neural That invariably happens. How complex is the neural network in the Well, it's actually, I, I mean, from what we know, it's relatively simple because they don't have many neurons to work. Right? So we don't know too much in too many animals, but there are very few neurons that seem to be involved in analyzing things. But what people are finding is that individual neurons seem to do a lot, maybe much more than in vertebrates. Again, because it's very sparse, we have very few components, so each of those components needs to be smarter. As in, when they are moving, suppose the, you change the position of the source. Yeah. <laughs> That's a question on which we spent a lot of time. Uh, let me, <laughs> let's say either empirically or from, you know, looking at the simulations and working backwards, we don't get any clue that they are using memory. So, so, you know, that what they did before, which is so bizarre because we totally expect it. But I still think it's a big open. So, so to answer your question, I'm not sure. You say there's some point that uh, the sum from both the ear, the, from both the eardrums, they are compared. So how is this comparison done in animals? They, they can't count. They can't right. count. But basically, it's done neurally, right? So is uh, it some kind of logical, like, I don't know, logical operation? But how is it? Uh, you set a threshold, basically. As I, I don't know how to put it in a natural image. I can try that. So it is so flat. So basically, you you have your auditory system on the left and on the right, okay, and um, it is stimulated by the sounds on the two sides. And the way that neurons finally code it is the number of action potentials per second, right? So coarsely, not exactly what it works. But let's say there's one with 10 action potentials per second and another with 4 action potentials per second, but 10 will be enough. <coughs> and the 10 will even inhibit the one that has 4. So that's the only one left standing. Uh, putting that in the abstract. That is known in pretty, pretty good detail for those animals. Sometimes it's Yeah, and there's a threshold. I mean, there'll be certain patterns that will never evoke us. Remember the exact thing. I don't want to give you a wrong. Yeah, is it compatible to the wavelength of the sound field? Oh, not at all. Oh my god. Yeah, Even the like 15 centimeters. Oh, 15 centimeters. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because it's a pretty low frequency. So. Yeah, that. Less than millimeter, probably. The total 
hundred micrometer yeah. No, not the length. The length will be in the millimeter range. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Total length. Total length will be in the millimeter. Yeah. In millimeters, because it goes through the. Yes. So it's a fraction of the uh, thickness? It's still a fraction. Small fraction. So it is sensitive to uh, interference. Sorry? It could be sensitive to the fact interference. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, crickets were the first and first insects to use. Oh. <laughs> so is that from fossil evidence? Like fossil evidence. Uh, we have fossils from back in the Permian. We have actually fossils of singing strategies. So I'm just curious that these uh, these uh, crickets are quite loud, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they go on for a very long time. And that's yeah. all. The other predators, they are not able to locate them or oh, yeah. what's the, I mean, they just, that sound doesn't seem to... It's almost a leading question <laughs> because that's what we're working on at the moment. We're trying to look at uh, predation and predators and whether they are oriented or designed. So, uh, for at least the bush crickets, the larger ones, bats are their major predators. And bats do use sounds to hone in on crickets. We've done some experiments with them. Uh, our question, so when you do it in the setup of a flight cage, which we've done a lot of experiments with, uh, yes, they will hold in. But our question is how often does it happen in the wild, which is what we are trying to uh, make sense. So they're able to do it that efficiently in the wild? Uh, they will, but the probabilities of encounter might be much lower. I mean, you've got to think of an animal singing on the ground, a bat flying through the air, how far apart they are, again, space comes into the image. So if they're close enough, and, and the millennials have their own tuning. Eh? So actually you could do the same exercise that I have done with the It's just much more difficult because it's three-dimensional, it's landscape scale. You have a flying predator and a moving thing. Uh, I hope before I retire I'll have the answers. <laughs> but those are much harder. We are trying. <laughs> or one of the sources, if you if you produce the same intensity at the position of the insect. But you produce it by moving the uh, source further, but increasing the loudness. So the percentage change in the loudness will be less at the cricket over that specific source. Once again, uh, tell, tell me again. Yeah. So if you if you produce the same loudness yeah. of due to one source at the position of the insect, yeah. but you do it by uh, increasing the distance of the source <coughs> and increasing the loudness too. Yeah. So then. Uh, Can we tell it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe if. If it's actually dynamically moving, possibly. We haven't done that experiment. But we, need, we are quite confident that if it's static, they can't actually tell the same. But the problem is the moment they move, everything changes, right? Yeah. As in so it's a hard experiment to do. People do it in these treadmills where the cricket. So the treadmill will keep walking, but it doesn't go anywhere. And then you can play with the sound because there's no uh, feedback. Okay, everything changes. Right, there are no more questions. Thanks.